Hello and welcome to another episode of The Mindset Forge, a podcast where we discuss the best ideas of humanity, the most useful practices and the most skillful means for developing a more well-adjusted and adaptive mindset. To do this, I will be discussing latest science, ancient philosophy that has stood the test of time, as well as the thoughts and actions of important historical paragons. The goal is to give you tools and practices and ideas for your self-improvement, with the goal of moving ahead the entire humanity. Our discussion will focus on the ideas and practices with the most cash value, so practices that are easy to take up but hold enormous potential. And since most of these practices have to do with changing your thinking and attitudes, they are completely free. Call me Laurent Lohel, I will be your host, and welcome aboard. Also, make sure to like Mindset Forge on Spotify and YouTube, as well as check out our Discord server, where you can find links to my book, which you can buy on Amazon to support my another side enterprise of being a fiction author. Without further ado, let's get to the episode. Mindset Forge, episode 10, relating to the world outside us. There are no facts, only interpretations. Friedrich Nietzsche. Very little is needed to make a happy life. It is all within yourself, in your way of thinking. Marcus Aurelius. In the nine previous episodes we have concentrated on ourself, which is just fitting considering the podcast is about self-improvement, but one of the most vital aspects of our happiness and fitness to our surroundings is how we relate to the outside world. In this episode I will discuss how various branches of philosophy and wisdom traditions relate to the outside world, and also discuss what science has to say about the matter. Remember fixed mindset. To recap, fixed mindset means that one believes our qualities and capabilities are more or less fixed at birth, so it it is futile to try and improve, and to fail at something means that you are a failure forever. Growth mindset, meanwhile, means that we hold the belief that we can improve, and failure just means we have to learn from our mistakes and train harder. A similar dichotomy of mindsets also holds for the outside world. A fixed mindset of the outside world holds that things have inherent meaning that is unalterable and we are more or less at their mercy. Analogically, a growth mindset of the outside world holds that things are not set in stone, but we can see them in different ways. And just like in the case of personal intelligence and other faculties, it is more adaptive to hold the growth mindset instead of the fixed one. We will discuss why and how to make this change in this episode. In the previous episodes, we have shown how separating ourselves from the outside world is not only misleading, It is downright delusional, based both on philosophy as well as the latest science. But just for the sake of the argument, we will discuss the person as separate from their surroundings in this episode, because if I had to point out how there is no real distinction every time the matter comes up, it would be very repetitive. The outside world seems to intrude upon us mainly in two ways. Either we go out to it in search of happiness, meaning, success or the like, not realizing those are found within, not without, or something comes from the outside to trespass on us, 
like stress, expectations of culture, morality or zeitgeist dictating how we should think and act and so on. All of these are massive sources of dissatisfaction and downright suffering, which is why we are going to be discussing a better mindset to hold about the outside world, which can lead to improvement in your personal life. Let us first tackle the issue I raised first, meaning we will investigate if it makes sense to look for happiness, meaning and so on in the outside world. Let's see what famous philosophies and wisdom traditions have to say on the matter. Let's explore the Stoic philosophy's teachings on relating to the outside world first. Stoicism offers valuable insights into finding meaning and happiness and dealing with external factors like expectations, stress and morality. We will examine these teachings and see how they can be integrated into our lives to cultivate a resilient and balanced approach to the world around us. Stoic teachings on relating to the outside world. Number one, the dichotomy of control. One of the fundamental tenets of Stoicism is the distinction between what is within our control and what is outside our control. According to the Stoics, we should focus our energy and attention on the things we can control such as our thoughts, beliefs and actions, while accepting the fact that we cannot control external events and circumstances. And this understanding can help us manage stress and anxiety more effectively and maintain a sense of inner peace and equanimity in the face of challenges. For example, we can control how much we train for some undertaking, but we alone can not decide its outcome. Imagine if you were a musician and you have a concert coming up. You can decide and control how much you train and hone your skills as high as they can go, but you cannot decide the audience reaction. You could do your best and they might still hate the show for whatever reason. Maybe they just don't like that type of music or maybe they had an unpleasant meeting just before and so on. The reasons don't matter, you cannot make them like your music. And that is why, according to the Stoics, it is not wise to concern yourself with the audience reaction. Just do your best and let uh, that be all the reward you need. Number two, inner virtue as the source of happiness. Stoics believed that true happiness and fulfillment come from cultivating inner virtues like wisdom, courage, justice and temperance. By focusing on personal growth and moral development, we can build a strong foundation of character that is not dependent on external validation or material success. This approach encourages us to look within ourselves for meaning and purpose, rather than seeking it in the outside world. In practice, this would mean setting for yourself goals that you find personally important and cultivating a calm and attentive mindset so you can respond with integrity instead of autonomous reflexes. Number 3. Emotional resilience and cognitive repraisal. Stoicism teaches that our emotional reactions to external events are shaped by our judgments and interpretations. By examining and challenging our beliefs, we can learn to reframe our perceptions and develop a more balanced and resilient emotional response to the world around us. This practice aligns with the concept of cognitive reappraisal discussed earlier. Number 4. Living in accordance with nature. Stoics believed that living in harmony with the natural order of the universe is the key to a fulfilling and meaningful life. By understanding the interconnectedness of all things and accepting the impermanence and unpredictability of life, we can develop a more adaptive and flexible mindset that allows us to navigate the complexities of the world 
filled with grace and wisdom. One example of this is when Emperor Aurelius gave his readers a tip on how to get out of bed when they feel like sleeping in. He maintains it is the natural role of people to work and not to sleep all day. So getting to work means you are fulfilling your natural role, which is a way to happiness. Another important influential wisdom tradition I keep bringing up is Buddhism. At this point it should come as no surprise that Buddhism also advises against looking for happiness in the outside world. In fact, in few traditions it is as expressly stated that happiness is something you get by letting go of grasping for things in the outside world and instead on focusing, cultivating your inner happiness. The Buddha thought that attaching such meaning to objects and accomplishments and so on is delusional. Everything is fundamentally empty of meaning, so to say that once I get this, I will also get happiness. Like there was happiness contained within the thing is ignorant. Instead, the practices of Buddhism teach one to let go of grasping and find peace and happiness in their own natural state. One way to look at it is that you don't have to change a thing and just start to be happy. But in practice, this does not work, at least when you first hear about it. So the practice begins with something like a long journey down a path and at the end you find yourself where you started except everything is completely transformed for the better. A tenet of Christianity I hear Buddhist teachers borrow most often is the kingdom of heaven is within. This teaching by Jesus of Nazareth is often taken to speak of the same thing, meaning that happiness is to be found within ourselves and not in the outside world, not even in the biblical heaven. But through cultivating our minds and emotions in this life, there appears to be some row about which translation is the most valid of this verse, and some interpret it to mean something else entirely. But what I just discussed is another popular way to understand this teaching. If ancient traditions are not your cup of tea, we have science to tell you the same exact thing, although in different expressions. In this segment we will explore the scientific research on the relationship between goal setting and mental and, em and emotional health. Specifically, we will examine the impact of pursuing external goals such as fame and money uh, compared to internal goals like personal growth and mastery. This discussion will provide insights into the potential benefits and drawbacks of different types of goals and how they might shape our well-being. External goals and mental health Studies have shown that pursuing external goals such as wealth, fame and physical attractiveness is associated with lower well-being and increased psychological distress. In a longitudinal study from the year 1993, individuals who prioritized extrinsic aspirations reported lower levels of self-actualization, vitality and overall life satisfaction, as well as higher levels of anxiety and depression. A meta-analysis of over 200 studies found that the pursuit of materialistic goals was negatively correlated with life satisfaction, self-esteem and overall psychological well-being. Additionally, materialistic values were positively correlated with depression, anxiety and narcissism. Internal goals and mental health in contrast, research has demonstrated that pursuing internal goals such as personal growth, meaningful relationships and community involvement is associated with greater psychological well-being and lower levels of distress. A study from the year 1993 found that individuals who prioritized intrinsic aspirations reported higher levels of self-actualization, vitality and life satisfaction. 
as well as lower levels of anxiety and depression. A study from the year 2009 showed that pursuing intrinsic goals was positively correlated with psychological need satisfaction, which in turn predicted greater well-being and lower levels of ill-being. This suggests that focusing on personal growth, relationships and community involvement can contribute to a more fulfilling and mentally healthy life. Uh, practical implications. Reflect on your personal goals and aspirations and consider whether they are primarily driven by external or internal factors. If you find that your goals are predominantly extrinsic, consider re-evaluating them to include more intrinsic elements. Set goals related to personal growth, mastery and meaningful relationships to promote greater mental and emotional well-being. These might include learning new skills, deepening connections with loved ones or engaging in community service. But remember that the most important relationship you have is your relationship to yourself. Cultivate an attitude of gratitude and contentment with what you have, rather than focusing on materialistic pursuits or comparing yourself to others. Conclusion, scientific research suggests that pursuing internal goals such as personal growth and mastery is associated with better mental and emotional health compared to chasing external goals like fame and money. By focusing on intrinsic aspirations and cultivating a mindset of gratitude and contentment, we can foster greater well-being and resilience in the face of life's challenges. We have previously discussed how to cultivate gratitude in an earlier episode. So, here we have it from multiple different sources, separated by thousands of years as well as thousands of kilometers. Yet all have come to more or less the same conclusion, which is that to look for happiness outside yourself is a sure way to misery. When you consider that the perception of happiness is ultimately just something born from chemical and electrical signals in your brain and body, this makes perfect sense. Why go out looking for something to open the valve of those chemicals when you can just develop your mind into a state where the valve never quite closes? And that is the more direct and effective approach both on paper and in practice. If you still find it difficult to stop grasping for things outside yourself, like success or a specific relationship, you can use cognitive reappraisal here as well. Before, we have mainly used it to magically turn sources of stress into exciting challenges or non-issues. Or maybe something humorous, depending on the situation. But now we will be using it to take the luster out of the thing we are grasping for. For example, if you crave for a relationship with a specific person and it just isn't happening, consider how much trouble a relationship is in the end. Less time for yourself, fights are inevitable, Instead of deciding for yourself you have to compromise, your feelings for the person will fade, as will the person's looks, and so on. Doing this removes the reward that is egging your dopamine system on, and replacing it with harm will make your brain work for you and cease its mad grasping. The Buddha taught something similar when he told people who were very possessed by their bodies to think of all the mucus, pus and other disgusting things the body holds, and also to meditate on the process of decomposition. If you think that the thing you want only has good sides, you are simply being delusional and willingly blind. There is st still the matter of the outside world intruding on us in the form of cultural expectation, morality and so on. 
What should we think of this? You are free to make up your mind and opinions, of course, I encourage that. But for me, the central value is freedom, so a mindset that liberates you from the shackles of such insidious outside influences is the best one, in my opinion. A thinker who greatly influenced me in this matter is Friedrich Nietzsche, so I will begin by discussing some of his thoughts uh, which are like a sledgehammer taken to the crystal castle of traditional views and systems of morality. In uh, this next segment we will explore Friedrich Nietzsche's concept of moving beyond good and evil, which encourages us to see the world through a more nuanced and less fixed lens. We will discuss how morality is shaped by culture and prevailing ideas, and how understanding this can lead to a more flexible and open-minded perspective. Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philosopher of the 19th century, argued that the concepts of good and evil are not objective and unchanging truths. Instead, he believed that these notions are deeply influenced by culture, societal values and power structures. According to Nietzsche, our ideas of what is right and wrong are often determined by the dominant ideologies of the time and the interests of those in power. Even though Nietzsche rarely mentions evolution and natural selection specifically, he shows great understanding of them and explains the development of morality and right and wrong with basically the process of unnatural selection, meaning breeding. He also says that morality is just another type of immorality. By this he means that morality is just another way to control and force people to act in a certain way. How can we say something like this? As long as there has been right and wrong, there has been punishment for the actions considered to be wrong. First it was probably excommunication from the tribe, but eventually the methods developed into things like crucifixation, hangings and the guillotine, meaning public executions. These kind of punishments would teach everyone witnessing them what happens to those who do wrong and prune those who did not comply from the gene pool. At the same time, those who played along nicely were more likely to prosper and move their genes down the stream. What is right means nothing more than what benefited the people in the past, while wrong means something that did not benefit them. And this means that most wrongs are thoughts, emotions and actions that don't contribute towards the most. The greatest mass of people the herd and its goals, so to speak. Nietzsche also discusses how the morality of the weaker yet most numerous part of the population came to dominate. In ancient times these people were the slaves of the high-ranking, more powerful people and had no real way to fight them. To survive they developed a sense of morality that glorified the way they had to behave and think to survive. From the point of view of the theory of natural selection, it makes perfect sense as this would make them even more adept at surviving. For example, this is how meekness, modesty and lack of aggression came to be considered virtues, while the characteristics of the lords and masters like pride, hardness and self-interest became vices. In time, as the numbers of the weakest grew, the system of morality overthrew that of the lords. Most of it was and is based on Judeo-Christian dogma, since all this meekness was supposed to be repaid by a place in heaven after death. These days, as the belief in Judeo-Christian values is waning, these values are left without a basis. 
This is why Nietzsche considered what he called the death of God. Such a terrible thing, the Western world would be left without a strong basis, lost and without a goal. In most developed countries, public executions are a thing of the past. Maybe they aren't needed anymore. Maybe we have been bred to be docile enough already. These ideals of right and wrong are still part of our lives, causing expectations that we are supposed to follow. There is nothing wrong with being selfless, of course, since our self is an illusion after all. That is not what I am saying. I am saying that since the reasons behind these values, at least in the Western world, have become meaningless for most, following them is unsatisfactory. Every thinking person has probably asked, why should I be selfless and meek when it was supposed to be rewarded after death, but I don't believe in an afterlife? At least I was bothered by this lack of meaning. I mean, what is the purpose to do anything? To me, following the law, just because it is the law, is very unsatisfactory. And similarly, following the prevalent mores was very unsatisfactory, since they are to be followed just because it's a good thing to do, which is just circular logic. Here, again, the answers are not to be found outside, but within. Both the teachings of Buddhism as well as findings of modern science tell us, like we have discussed before, how helping others out of compassion is a great source of joy and well-being for the helper themselves. So help others because it helps you, and you can feel and witness the change into a more happy and relaxed person. The same also works for behaviors you should avoid. Let's take a reason for not coveting and being jealous I find highly unsatisfactory, that of the Old Testament. It is stated in the Ten Commandments that you should not covet anything that is your neighbor's. In fact, this is stated twice. If you break this commandment, you are cursed to hell. But these days, when belief in God is waning day by day, and very few honestly believe in God, hell and the Ten Commandments, what reason is there not to covet your neighbor's things? Again, there are no good, satisfying reasons to be found outside of you, and yet again the reasons are found through introspection. Buddhism to the rescue. What the Buddha taught, translated from Sanskrit into the modern language of neuroscience, is that the neural pathways in your brain grow stronger by use. So, when you covet something, those neural pathways grow stronger, making you covet things even more. And this pathway is not removed by attaining those things. No, the hunger remains and cannot be sated. This is a horrible way to live. And that is why you should not covet things. Not because of some ancient law or even modern law, but because it is making you into a worse, less happy person. The real answers can be found by studying yourself mindfully. The same reasons hold for all negative emotions like anger, greed, excessive pride and so on. This absolutely does not mean you should neglect the outside world and turn away from it completely, just meditate in inside a locked room all day or something like that. But when you cultivate happiness and meaning within yourself, you stop looking for it in the outside world, and the world can then appear to you just as it is, which is beautiful, miraculous and marvelous. Because our inner state influences our perception, and when we are happy and not grasping for some satisfaction, the world we see reflects that.
And just because morals and laws are make-believe and lack a proper basis, that does not mean you can just do whatever, ignoring all commonly held beliefs and laws. The most obvious result of engaging in this kind of behavior will be that people will dislike you and you might get in trouble with the law, which still functions even if you find their commandments empty. On a deeper and in my view more important level, behaving immorally makes you into a worse person and thinking that nothing matters makes life meaningless when meaning is very important to have. This is why it is still important to act morally, not because of outside tenets, but because of the natural laws your brain and body follows. Returning to moral judgments, meaning outside moral concepts that we are taught at as children in the Western world, let's discuss some ways we can untangle ourselves of this burden of historical baggage. To move beyond good and evil, we must recognize that our moral judgments are often based on culturally ingrained beliefs rather than objective truths. This does not mean that we should abandon morality entirely, but rather than we should be open to questioning and re-evaluating our beliefs. Develop cultural awareness. Understanding that morality is shaped by cultural context can help us appreciate the diversity of human values and ethical systems. By learning about different cultures and their moral beliefs, we can develop a broader perspective on what constitutes good and evil. For example, in some countries executing people for certain crimes is accepted, while in others it is not. Is the another side wrong and therefore more evil? Of course not, they just live in different cultures, which has shaped how they see things. Question your own beliefs. Recognizing that your moral judgments are shaped by your upbringing, cultural background and personal experiences. Challenge yourself to examine these influences and consider alternative perspectives. Empathy and understanding. Moving beyond good and evil involves practicing empathy and understanding towards others, even when their beliefs and actions differ from our own. By acknowledging the complexity of human experience, we can foster compassion and tolerance. Embrace moral ambiguity. Recognize that life often presents us with morally ambiguous situations that defy simple categorizations of good and evil. Embracing this complexity can lead to a more nuanced and flexible approach to ethical decision making. Cultivate critical thinking. Develop your ability to think critically about moral issues and engage in open-minded discussion with others. This can help you challenge your own beliefs and consider alternative viewpoints. Conclusions. By moving beyond fixed notions of good and evil, we can develop a more open-minded, empathetic and flexible approach to morality. Understanding that our moral beliefs are deeply influenced by culture, societal values and power structures allows us to question and re-evaluate our judgments and foster greater tolerance and understanding towards others. In other words, we will see how our values and morals are empty and it is therefore delusional to judge other people based on such meaningless ideas. Having done this, we can create our own values. Nietzsche called the person capable of this Übermensch or Superman where the comic book character got his name. With a change in mindset, you won't be able to lift a train car, but you will be able to carry burdens of your daily life that used to be too much, and all the setbacks that used to wound you like bullets will simply bones of your mental skin, or if your mind is flexible enough, you'll just avoid them entirely, like with super speed.
when you experience what this kind of mental freedom and flexibility can achieve, it truly feels like a superpower. I think that concludes this episode, which is quite different from all the previous ones, at least in subject and perspective. To briefly summarize the best and practically only way to find happiness, peace and contentment is to cultivate it within ourselves, which can be achieved by the many tools we have discussed in the previous episodes, like mindfulness, gratitude practices in making use of embodied effects on our emotion and cognition and so on. It is short-sighted and counterproductive, unskillful to look for happiness in the outside world, and one should also make sure not to let outside thoughts and systems weigh and tie them down, and instead be free to make their own path to liberation and happiness, while recognizing that just because these outside rules don't have much backing them up, it is still necessary to act according to them, as long as most people around us blindly believe in them. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Mindset Forge. I hope you found it informative and the lessons and practices spoken in it relevant to your situation. I also hope you found it as entertaining to listen as I found making it to be. If you found it beneficial, be sure to follow Mindset Forge on Spotify as well as on YouTube where you can also give us a thumbs up. Also, make sure to check out our Discord server for further discussion, where you can contact me directly. Links in description and channel information. There you can also find the link to my book, which I have self-published on Amazon, called Death Drive. If speculative dystopian Near future sci-fi sounds like a cup of tea. Getting the book is a great way to support my work as an author. So have a nice day and memento, kerebrum formare.